your understanding about the origins of COVID-19 will be challenged by a leading Australian scientist. My exclusive television interview that I'm going to bring you right now with Professor Nikolai Petrovsky from Flinders University in Adelaide. It's part of a Sky News special investigation, which is going to air next Sunday, a week today at 7.30 p.m. Now, we're examining not just whether the virus inadvertently leaked from a laboratory in Wuhan, but whether it was created in a laboratory. Yes, created. This is a possibility. The revelations start tonight, right now. Flinders University in Adelaide and La Trobe University in Victoria have done a preliminary study waiting peer review titled In Silico Comparison of Spike Protein ACE2 Binding Affinities Across Species, Significance for the Possible Origin of SARS-CoV-2 Virus. That's the name of the, the study. Now, the way the coronavirus enters human cells is by binding to a of lung cells called ACE2. This Australian study has found that COVID-19 binds more tightly to human ACE2 than to any of the other animals they tested. Professor Nikolai Petrovsky, who you are about to hear from, has been working on a vaccine for the coronavirus after developing vaccines for Ebola, influenza and animal SARS. He's from the College of Medicine and Public Health at Flinders University. Here's my interview with him from earlier this week. Professor, can you start by telling me about your research? So we started modelling the COVID-19 virus back in January uh, in order to design a vaccine candidate. And when, when we had finished the design of the vaccine candidate, we, we then went on to explore whether we could use the same modelling approach to try and better understand where the virus originally came from, uh, you know, to explore what animal species might have been involved in the transmission to humans. And what did you find? What were your study's findings? So the study findings were very interesting, which is that we found that the COVID-19 virus uh, was particularly well adapted to bind to human cells. And that was far superior to its ability to bind the cells of any other uh, animal species, which is is quite unusual because typically when a virus is is well adapted to an animal and then it by chance crosses to a human, typically you would expect it to originally have lower binding to human cells than to the original host animal. We found the opposite. So, so that was a big surprise. So what does that actually mean in terms of the origins of the virus? So what it means is that we, the, we really don't know where this virus has come from. I mean, that's the truth. Um, you know, the, the, the two possibilities, which I think are both still open, are firstly that it was a chance transmission of a virus from an as yet unidentified animal to humans. Uh, the other possibility, of course, is that it was an accidental release of the virus from uh, a laboratory. Why do the majority of scientists think that it is more likely to have been a naturally occurring virus rather than the second option of an accidental leak from a laboratory? So scientists, uh, you know, try to, to, to not be political. So we just try to base our, our findings on facts rather than um, taking particular p political positions. But sometimes, obviously, you know, the, the alternatives may have unintended consequences. So, for instance, if, if it was to turn out that this virus came about because of an accidental lab release, that would have implications for how we do viral research all in laboratories all around the world, which, which, which could make doing research much harder. And so I think the inclination of virus researchers would be to presume uh, that it came from an animal uh, until proven otherwise, because, because that will have less ramifications for, for how we're able to do research in, in the future. The, the alternative obviously has, has some quite major implications uh, for, for science and, and science on viruses, not just obviously political ramifications, which we're all well aware of. 
Can you explain to us what it is about COVID-19 and the ACE2 receptor that means it is so unusual for it to have naturally crossed species? The important thing to understand is that every virus, in, in order to infect us, it, it has to be transported into our cells. And so each virus essentially tricks uh, 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 the cells in, in the species they are infecting uh, by binding to a receptor on those cells and then getting taken up inside the cell with the receptor. And different viruses bind different receptors, which are essentially just proteins that are on our, the surface of our cells that have a, a, a an, another function. So the, the virus is really just acting like a hitchhiker, getting a lift inside our cells. In the case of COVID-19 or, or SARS coronavirus 2, it hitchhikes on a receptor on our cells uh, called ACE2 or angiotensin uh, 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 converting enzyme 2. And the, the normal role of ACE2 is to regulate our blood pressure. Obviously, the virus is just tricking the ACE2 to, to allow it to get inside the cell. But so that's why ACE2 is so important because the viral spike protein of COVID-19 binds to ACE2 and that's how it gets into the cell. If, if we block ACE2 or we remove ACE2 from the cells, the virus can't get inside and so it actually can't infect us. So it's a very critical step in, in making this virus able to infect humans is it has to be able to bind ACE2. Now, in this case, this virus binds ACE2 in humans better than any other animal. So that means it's better adapted to infect humans than, than any other animal. And that's surprising because it, it, it you know, we're not aware that it, it actually has had, um, had the opportunity to, do, to adapt to this human receptor before. Professor, how do you know it adapts to humans better than any other animal? So we were able to model uh, the binding of the COVID-19 uh, spike protein to ACE2 from a whole range of different species, from human to monkey to pangolins, cats and dogs, um, you know, a whole variety of different species. And what we're able to show with the, the modeling approach is that the binding of the virus to human cells was stronger than for the cells of any other species. So it really looked like this was a virus that, that is optimally designed to infect humans. Is anyone else in the world doing this research? So a, a number of, of other groups have attempted um, to, to take a similar approach. They've looked at a more limited number of species and also they haven't done the modelling as rigorously as, as we have. Um, so, you know, essentially we believe that our results are the strongest ones out there at the moment. Are there any other initial findings that others have come up with that are similar to yours? Scientists uh, have been able to directly measure the binding of the, the virus to human cells and to human ACE2. Um, and in fact, their results have completely confirmed what our modelling had predicted, that the binding of the virus to, to the human receptor is exceptionally high. Uh, relative to, to the binding to the receptors of, of other species such as mice. So, so it's nice to have the laboratory experiments actually confirming uh, yeah. our modelling uh, predictions. What is the next step now in answering this? How do you continue to investigate whether this is a highly unusual coincidence or whether the human receptor has been genetically altered? So the if, if we could find the the, the virus, you know, um, that in animals that that was the predecessor to COVID-19, that, that would make it very clear. Um, unfortunately, no such virus has been identified in any animal species, either in bats or, or in any potential uh, intermediate vector. So the absence of, of that evidence means that that's why it's an unknown question of where this virus came from. So we need to do more research, certainly. We need to keep looking for these viruses in different animals to see if we can find uh, an identical virus that, that may have caused this. 
Uh, but, you know, I guess at the same time, we need an investigation into the other possibilities of where this virus may have come from. And that would require really, a, you know, an independent, um, you know, uh, scientific panel to, to be put together and they would then have the opportunity to, to really investigate, um, you know, where the virus may have come from in China, whether it came from an animal or whether it might have come from an accidental release. Just to be really clear, Professor, if it was an inadvertent leak from a laboratory, are you saying that the virus has been genetically altered to include this ACE2 receptor that makes it more adaptable to human cells? When, when we see a new virus, often they, um, you know, viruses, when they meet, um, and we know this from pandemic influenza viruses, they swap genetic information. So, for instance, if you have a single animal uh, such as a pig that's infected by two influenza viruses at the same time, that can generate a new third influenza virus by the genes being swapped between the two viruses. The same can happen for coronaviruses. So when we look at COVID-19, we find genetic elements that are very similar to bat coronaviruses, but, you know, there are uh, some genetic elements uh, that uh, uh, come from other coronaviruses. So, so one of the possibilities is that an animal host was infected by two coronaviruses at the same time, and COVID-19 is the, is the progeny of that interaction between the two viruses. The same process can happen in, in a Petri dish. So if you have cells in, in culture, uh, and you have human cells in that culture which the viruses are, are infecting, then if there are two viruses in that dish, they can swap genetic information and you can accidentally or deliberately create a whole third new virus out of that um, system. So in other words, COVID-19 could have been created from that um, recombination event in an animal host or it could have occurred in a cell culture, you know, um, experiment. That is extraordinary because everything we've heard to date is that the virus was not created in a laboratory and now you're saying this is actually a possibility. Certainly we can't exclude the possibility that, you know, this came from a, a laboratory experiment rather than from an animal. Um, you know, they, they both open possibilities. I'm not saying, you know, necessarily anything is probable but if you're talking possibilities, then I have not seen any data that definitively excluded uh, that, you know, the form of possibility. So I think both possibilities remain open uh, until we can find better evidence that indicates it was one or the other. Why is it important for us to know the origins of this virus? I think that as scientists and, and the world, uh, as a community, we, we desperately need to know where this virus came from. Um, and the reason for that is not political, it's actually pragmatic. If, if this is a wild virus that came from an animal and we don't know where it came from in the animal kingdom, then, you know, in a few years' time, we may be facing a very similar pandemic. So it's, it's absolutely critical that we work out how did this virus come to humans in, in the first place. And, and so, as I say, this is not, it's not for a political agenda, it's actually for a health agenda that we have to get to the bottom of the facts. Just for transparency, do you have any political affiliations? No, I, as I say, I don't, I, I'm, I'm sort of have no particular political persuasion. Um, so, um, you know, as a scientist, I just try to, to follow the science and, um, so we, we don't have any particular agenda here other than to do, try and do good science. Professor, what needs to happen now in terms of an investigation to get to the bottom of the origins of the virus? My view is the inquiry should start straight away because it's like any evidence trails, the longer you leave it, the, you know, whatever they say, the more faint the evidence trail. Um, so, it, you know, for that reason, it really needs to happen. It should have already happened. I think the idea of putting it off till the pandemic is over, it would be a mistake because, as I say, it's it's better to go in when it's hot and it's easier to track down, you know, what might have happened.
So um, I'm, I'm certainly very much in favour of a scientific investigation. It shouldn't be politically driven. It should be scientifically driven. And its only objective should be to get to the bottom of how, how did this pandemic happen? And most importantly, how do we prevent a future pandemic? You know, that's the purpose of the investigation, not not to have a witch hunt, not to point fingers at individuals, um, uh, but but one, how did it happen? And how do we use that information to prevent this happening again? That, that should be the only sort of uh, objective of the inquiry.